Hello everyone. This is a great um, pleasure and honor to be giving this lecture as part of the Osaka Social Determinants of Health Summer School 2020. Um, I will now switch to the slideshow, um, but I thought you'd like to see my face. My name is Eric Brunner. I'm Professor of Epidemiology at the University College London Institute of Epidemiology and Healthcare and a visiting professor in Professor Eso's Department of Public Health at Osaka University. The title of my lecture is Social Epidemiology in the Whitehall 2 Study looking into the post-pandemic future. I'm gonna talk about four things, population health and prevention. Um, so thinking about the definition of social epidemiology, which we'll be talking about um, in this uh, three-day seminar. Um, I'll be talking about the Whitehall 2 study, the work and research that we've done <clears throat> on health inequalities and aging. And then I will talk about um, the post-pandemic future using um, as the data um, comprehensive survey of living conditions in Japan, which is work uh, which I've been doing uh, with Ayako Hiyoshi, Kaori Honjo and others um, based in Japan. So what is public health? What's the basic idea? Well, to understand it, we need to know what is a healthy society. And it is much more than medical care and individual behavior, which is quite often what people think about. But above all, what we need to do is to rely for our thinking on scientific evidence. In other words, this is an empirical research based question. And a very important um, consideration is that health as well as being the property of individuals, is also a property of society. So for example, we know how important smoking is for determining, or should I say, destroying health. And here we can see that the smoking rates in uh, Japanese and American adults um, show a very, clear and consistent pattern. Although it changes over time, the rate of smoking is very much a characteristic of the population according to demographic group and of course other properties as well. And um, in a way it's this characteristic which forms the basis of epidemiology, which is to study the determinants of health and disease um, in large groups, such as um, national populations. So um, what about healthcare? Well, we can see um, that there's a very obvious idea um, of treating the people who are sick. In order to do that, of course, we first have to identify them, we have to find them. And um, we might do this, for example, by measuring blood pressure of adults at the age of 40, as is done in Japan. And we will then end up with a distribution looking something like this, where blood pressure 
tends to distribute itself around a mean value, which is the highest point in this bell curve. And in the medical model, what we do is to treat the highest uh, group of people. So a, a small minority who are at the highest risk get the treatment to try to either treat the disease or prevent it, depending on the context. But Jeffrey Rose, a very important epidemiologist who worked at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine uh, back in the 70s and 80s, um, saw the difference between the causes of disease at the social level and the causes of each individual case. And this idea led to the idea of the causes of the causes, which uh, has been championed by Michael Marmot and others of us in the modern public health era. So to give you some examples of this, if everyone smoked 20 cigarettes a day, then clinical case control and cohort studies alike would lead us to conclude that lung cancer was the genetic disease. And in one sense, that would be true. And the reason for that is because with everybody smoking, the people who would develop lung cancer would be the people who had a genetic or biological susceptibility. Another example would be to think about countries with a high prevalence of overweight, such as the United Kingdom, United States. And those two countries have a very high prevalence of type 2 diabetes. So this is an, this is an example of a particular kind of sick society. But within that, at the individual level, we know that overweight individuals who do not exercise are at the, at, at the highest risk, at increased risk of type 2 diabetes. So we can think both about the risk at the country level, the population level, and at the individual level. And this is very, very important. Because if we think about a population or public health approach to health, we can think about um, that bell-shaped curve, that distribution of blood pressure in the population. And of course, this would apply to other risk factors as well. <clears throat> that we can consider treating not just those at highest risk, but treating the population as a whole and trying to change the distribution of risk factors to a better, more favorable, healthier level. So that's the public health or population health model, very different from one which is based on treating only people at high risk. So now thinking specifically about social epidemiology, we can define it as the study of the social, economic, behavioral and cultural determinants of health within and between populations. Social epidemiological studies look at social, economic, gender and other inequalities in health, which are the causes of the causes. They're the group um, population level factors and the way they're distributed rather than looking at individuals. Social epidemiology examines the conditions of human development from birth, during development and in adult life and their influences on health of groups and individuals. Social epidemiology also studies a range of explanations, including material, psychological, behavioral, biological factors, and the importance of healthcare. So related to this, what do we mean by public health? Well, one way of thinking about it is to think what is a healthy society. And these are uh, some not incredibly um, thought through, but my, my ideas about what's important. So a healthy society is one in which 
there are no excessive inequalities and we would obviously have to think about what we mean by excessive a healthy society is one which guarantees individuals their human rights, including the right to health and health care, which minimizes social exclusion, which educates its citizens, which regulates markets such as the market for health care, and importantly, uses evidence to make policy. And that's, of course, where the research. Um, um, is so crucial. So turning to my um, second objective, I want to talk about the Whitehall studies. So I've been working as an investigator on the Whitehall study for many years. The Whitehall studies are named such because they consist of government or civil servants um, who have been recruited into a cohort, a closed cohort, which recruits people at the baseline and then follows them up over the years to see um, which ones remain healthy and which ones become sick, which ones die prematurely and studies the reasons for those differences. So a very, um, important and uh, well-known study which was conducted now 42 years ago is the study of um, heart disease mortality according to the grade of employment for civil servants. There were two um, uh, cohorts um, which contributed towards the Whitehall 2 study and this one is the first Whitehall study, where participants were recruited um, in 1967 to 69. And here, what you can see in the graph is that when they were followed up for seven and a half years, that the people who died of um, a heart attack tended to be the people in the lowest grade. So you can see in the graph that um, the, uh, the relative risk of coronary mortality was four times higher in the bottom grade, over three times higher in the clerical office worker support grade, and even in the middle ranking professional grade, it was double the level in the top administrator grade. Um, this study was an early use of a technique called multiple logistic regression, and the white space shows the amount of excess risk not explained by the measured risk factors. And as we can see, two thirds of the risk factor, um, oh, sorry, two thirds of the mortality differences were not explained by the risk factors shown on the figure, cholesterol, smoking, blood pressure, and a couple of others. This observation of massive inequality, even in a cohort of people who were both healthy and in secure employment and not poor, um, was a startling, a very important observation, which led uh, to a huge research agenda um, in Europe and America. And it allowed us um, to recruit a second cohort, this time of women as well as men, starting in 1985 um, and involving follow-ups in a clinic where uh, people had their cardiovascular risk factors measured, uh, where they answered um, cognitive function tests, um, were subjected to, to multiple clinical testing over um, the past um, more than 35 years. And um, you can see that there were roughly 12 waves of data with an interval between the clinics of five years and between 
the questionnaire only way, so also about five years. And at the moment, we um, are in the middle of phase 13, but COVID has prevented us from, um, from measuring everybody. And we hope to be able to raise the funding to go back to the cohort next year. And through our research, we've developed um, a social determinants of health research model, which is a kind of overall framework to guide our thinking. And what you can see is um, uh, two uh, diagonal lines, a top line, which is called the direct stress pathway, which suggests that there may be effects on health due to one's social status, social and economic position, resources, education. There's the bottom tram line, the indirect behavioural pathway, which recognises that factors such as smoking, diet, exercise and alcohol consumption are also determined by our social and cultural environment and will have a very important effect on health. And what we're doing in our research is examining those associations and further than that, considering um, the, the effect of material circumstances on their own, the effect of early life, of genetics and cultural influences on a host of different risk factors shown at the bottom right hand corner, um, well-being, mortality, morbidity. And we will look um, in detail at um, the Japanese um, context in relation to well-being and mortality um, in a couple of minutes. So we use civil service employment grade as one of um, our measures of socioeconomic status. And as I said, in the civil service, no one is poor. The same thing would be true in the Japanese government service. Everyone has job security and a pension, but they also have rank. They also have a hierarchical position, which is characterized by differences in income, education, social status, and um, psychological aspects of their job, how much control they have, um, how much variety they have, and how, how many skills they use. And this tends to be, uh, the, these um, job characteristics tend very strongly to be related to um, higher hierarchical position. And when we follow up, um, these individuals um, for coronary mortality and the same would be true in Japan if we, we were following stroke mortality for example we can see that there is a stepwise gradient in the risk of coronary death so people with the highest status um, here are set to an odds ratio of one. And as we go down the hierarchy, um, in the gray bars, you can see that the risk increases. And even if we take account of behavioral factors, smoking, blood pressure, plasma cholesterol, blood glucose and height, we can see um, that, that gradient um, is still there for us to see very strongly. And this graph is looking um, similarly um, at mortality, total mortality over 25 years. And when we look at, um, in this case, the first Whitehall study, if we look at men um, according to age, we can see that the inequalities persist right into um, old age so the oldest in that top group on the right hand side is 89 so inequalities do not disappear they go right across the life course 
And in order to understand these inequalities, it's useful to look at um, some new and um, less studied risk factors like the metabolic syndrome. And here we can see in the Whitehall 2 study that for both men and women, there are social gradients, this time according to six levels of employment grade going from high on the left to low on the right, um, which contributes um, to cardiometabolic risk, which is to say risk of um, cardiovascular disease and risk of diabetes. And one of the interesting things that we have done in Whitehall is to try to measure stress hormones. And um, a number of years ago now, we conducted a case control study looking at normetanephrine or noradrenaline, urinary cortisol excretion, heart rate variability, which measures um, the autonomic um, excitability of the heart at rest, heart rate at rest, and the inflammatory response measured by um, serum interleukin-6, in uh, measured in the basal fasting state. And we can see here that the metabolic syndrome is very interesting because it appears to correspond to a level of elevated stress even at, in, even at rest. So we can see here that when we compare the metabolic syndrome cases with the controls, that they had higher levels or more adverse levels of both adrenaline and cortisol. They had lower heart rate variability, higher heart rates, and higher levels of interleukin-6. So certainly some evidence for the direct stress-related pathway, um, which um, is shown here in the top diagonal line. <coughs> we, we also measured um, at enormous expense and with massive effort um, six um, saliva samples in 2,800 people in the protocol measure, uh, sorry, 2,800 people in the cohort um, in order to study the diurnal rhythm in cortisol. And this is, a, in a way, addressing a kind of Eastern medical approach, which is about the daily rhythm in people's lives and thinking that those people who have a disturbed rhythm may be uh, the people who are at risk of low well-being and a higher risk of disease. And we used a, a type of latent uh, variable modeling, sophisticated modeling, taking all these six measures into account at the same time and what we showed was that there was a smaller group which consisted of 800 of the 2,800 people in the sample who appeared to have a raised level of cortisol across um, the day. And the predictors of the class membership, this, this disturbed level in um, in a, a subgroup of the population were low employment grade, um, lower levels of wealth, smoking, short sleep, stress on the sampling day, and slow walking speed. Very interesting observations indeed. But this stress research is very difficult. We want to be able to show that stress is an important factor in accounting for inequalities in health. But when we looked in our cohort at um, uh, job stress in relation to that diurnal cortisol pattern, we can see here that 
the differences between the groups stratified according to their level of job stress, in this case called effort reward imbalance, which we can discuss later. Um, we can see um, that the differences between the groups were present, but they were very subtle. And what this points to is the fact that although there are these differences in um, the rhythm of hormones which um, reflect different levels of stress in different groups in the population, they are really subtle and very difficult to measure even in a large research study, in this case with um, almost 3,000 people. So switching to a different research topic, as our cohort has got older and um, they were aged 35 to 55 at baseline, now they're aged um, um, about 70 to 90, we can study not only aging, but also the factors in the middle of life, in midlife, which determine quality of life and health in the aging period, because we can look forward um, from the age of about 50. And my overall summary of what we're showing and what, what our research very much confirms is that health and functioning at older ages depend on material and psychosocial resources. And by this, I'm talking in terms of our measurements about education, occupation, income, and wealth. This is some work done by a Japanese student who took our master's course um, back in about 2016, I believe, uh, Dr. Tanaka. And what he did here was to look at social inequalities and health related functioning, but also to look at the question of recovery. And this is a relatively new and under researched area. And on the left, we can see how often poor health occurs. And on the right, we can see different patterns of recovery. And what he did was to analyze this by stratifying, by grouping our participants into high, medium, and low employment grade. And what you can see on the left is that um, both for poor physical health and for poor mental health, there are, that there are very clear gradients. So in low employment grade, a much higher likelihood at any cross-sectional point in the measurement that individuals will report that they've got poor physical health and poor mental health, according to a standard multi-item questionnaire. And then on the right, we can see that when we followed up people over about a five-year period and four repeated cycles, 24,000 personal observations, that we could see that those in the highest employment grades, in the high employment grade, were over 50% um, of, of those recovered, whereas in the low employment grade, it was somewhere in the region of 40. So we can see that health inequalities affect not only the occurrence the development incidence of disease, but they also affect the likelihood of people recovering from their functional problems as they get older. Another example of some recent work we've done is to look at risk factors for cognitive, mental, and physical functional decline. And we looked at 12 risk factors and you will be very interested to hear that the ones which um, were consistently related um, to uh, cognitive and physical decline were inadequate physical activity, hypertension, high blood pressure, and poor lung function 
which of course is um, partly explained by smoking. So leaving the social epidemiology to some extent behind and certainly the Whitehall 2 study, I now want to show you some fascinating Japanese data by way of looking into the post-COVID-19 pandemic future. So COVID-19 reminds us of our deep vulnerability to environmental threats. After all, that's what the virus is. The pandemic makes us think about global challenges, inequalities in health and well-being, different groups having very different levels of vulnerability and then severity in terms of COVID-19. It makes us think about economic growth and at the same time about climate change. And so the question which um, I want to discuss with you is this one. We are living through a time of severe disruption. And what I'd like to know is whether we will be able to seize this moment whether we will in the future be able to save the planet as well as ourselves, because we know that climate change is a major problem. And in the UK, because we've had such a, a terrible pandemic, we have seen um, that different groups have different vulnerabilities and have had very different experiences during um, the past four or five months. Age and gender are one of those problems. And we can see here um, a histogram which shows according to age group, the, um, the share um, of, of people according to age that are in the shutdown sectors of the economy. And we can see that it is young people, not the people who are most at risk from the disease, but people who will experience in the long term over the coming decades, the consequences of the epidemic. And, it, and we can see in the UK particularly that it is women who are um, at risk of, of being out of work, either temporarily or permanently. It is also true that the people at the bottom end of society, the ones on lowest earnings, lowest income, who are the ones who are most likely to be in the shutdown sectors of the economy. I guess that the same thing will be true in Japan. When we look at death rates um, during the months of March and April in England, we can also see evidence for substantial inequalities. So in gray, you can see um, the number of deaths um, as a percentage of difference from the least deprived decile, which is on the left-hand side. And you can see that there's a gradual stepwise increase as the level of area deprivation um, that the individual lives in um, increases. But for COVID, you can see that in the bottom three deciles, the bottom 30% of the population, that there is a extra high impact in terms of COVID-19 deaths. So turning to the climate change theme, we can see um, that um, the lockdown that we had in the UK over several months, um, and I know it's been less severe in Japan, um, has drawn attention to the fact that the environment is really very strongly affected by human activity. So in a way it has highlighted, and it's certainly true that it did it for me, um, that the environmental gains that could be 
um, achieved if we changed the way we lived as a society. Another way of thinking about this is whether or not we're going to be able to decarbonize our economy. And on the left, you can see a picture of a koala bear in Australia, which was a photo taken in January during their terrible um, catastrophe of forest fires um, in Southeast Australia. So we face a problem if we don't change. Desert spreading, wars over resources such as water, mass human migration, which could be up to half the world's population, three, four billion people migrating because climate change has destroyed the possibility um, of a continuing way of life ice sheets melting and as a result sea level rising and cities being um, swallowed up by the sea. So in the post-pandemic period there will no doubt be a return to growth, there will be a return to economic growth to some extent, but to what extent will that also include climate protection? One of the issues here is whether the economic rebound, the economic um, in, in increase when the pandemic goes away or tends to go away, will there be business as usual? Will there be green growth with more emphasis on um, decarbonizing? Or radically, some economists are even talking about the idea of degrowth. The economics of enough. The idea in the graph at the bottom of the slide that it is only through degrowth that we can actually have a, a population of the world, currently, of course, well above 7 billion people, um, who do not exceed the Earth's capacity uh, to provide resources. And of course, you know, there's the issue of accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So some economists are saying, well, maybe what we should be thinking about is not green growth, but actually degrowth. And this raises a very important point. If we have a stagnant economy, can we also have population health? John Maynard Keynes, who's a very famous economist um, who spent a lot of time in the UK and, um, and Canada, talked about animal spirits. The idea that there is a kind of close linkage between the way the economy is working is it, is it booming? Is it growing? Um, do we feel that we're um, working towards having higher incomes, higher salaries, accumulating wealth? There is a close relationship between that feeling about the economy and our sense of well-being and our, and our health. What's the relationship between them? So in other words, if we're thinking that we've got to have lower growth, we've got to think more carefully about our planet. We've got to think about carbon dioxide, stopping the use of fossil fuels. Can we have our planet and our health? And one way of thinking about this is the orthodoxy that our well being depends on economic growth is one which really stands in the way of bringing all these major factors together in the post-pandemic world. So Japan offers a brilliant natural experiment to, to think about this question, did economic stagnation in Japan in the period 92 to 2013 lead to poorer health and greater health inequality? 
we can see here that the economic history of Japan after World War II can be divided into two very clear periods. The first was a period of um, exponential growth, which went up until 1992, and the other is a slower but um, un un uncertain, but still very clear decline, where the economy, um, in terms of the stock exchange, fell back to the level it was in the 1980s. And in terms of annual growth in the economy, we can see here that growth in Japan went down from about 10% um, to 5% um, into the 1980s, but then fell to a much lower level of about 0.9% on average in the 90s and up to 2013, much lower than in the UK and the USA, where it was over 2%. So first of all, looking at the hard data, looking at the age standardized all-cause mortality rate over this period, we can see that as Japan went into the low growth period, that there was a very slight slowdown in the improving rate of mortality. But Japan continued to do very, very well with all-cause mortality. And you can see that throughout that period of economic stagnation, that Japan continued to outperform um, France, the UK, USA, and even South Korea, although South Korea is catching up very quickly. It's also interesting to note that um, in comparison to Japan, that the USA and the UK's mortality rates flattened out after 2010, a factor, uh, uh, a change in the trend, which is um, in our, in our um, interpretation often accounted for by um, the economic problems and the lack of um, public spending in the Anglo-Saxon countries. And Japan's very good performance continues um, through the study period with the economic stagnation when you look at it according to specific causes, namely ischemic heart disease, cancer and stroke. It's particularly true uh, for ischemic heart disease, and um, that's always been the case. For cancer, it's interesting that the Japanese rate, if anything, ex the, the improvement in the rate of cancer mortality accelerated during the period of economic stagnation. For suicide, we can see what may be a, a reaction to the economic stagnation because we can see that in the mid 90s that there was a rise in the suicide rate um, both in men and women in Japan. However, it's also true that this flattened out and uh, since about 2008 it started to decline and I think this is uh, an example of the way in which um, Japanese health policy um, has been a great success. It's also interesting to note um, as we look at this um, graph comparing Japan with other countries that the rate of suicide um, is not enormously higher um, in Japan than it is in uh, European countries um, and America. So now turning to uh, the new and really very interesting part of the, of the data presentation, um, we are going to examine the same study period, the economic stagnation of 92 to 2013, using 
um, the Comprehensive Survey of Living Conditions, a nationally representative survey with 10 waves of data collection in, all, in almost three quarters of a million people. And what this data allows us to do is to examine the trend in inequality and well-being according to income over the period of economic stagnation. Before we look at that data, here is um, the trend in the Gini coefficient, which is inequality in income before tax in the top line and, uh, and after tax in the bottom line. And we can see that the um, relatively low level of income inequality in Japan that has, has tended to rise slightly, um, but after adjusting for the changes in the age structure of the population at household level um, and adjusting for household size and prefecture, that there is really not a huge increase, if any, in the income genie over the period of low growth. So what happened to good and poor self-rated health in Japan in this low growth period um, overall? And here we can see the data from the CSLC divided into four age groups. So it's the children and teenagers top left, working age adults top right, the younger old bottom left and the older old bottom right. And um, if we focus on the adults um, working age, we can see that between 1992 and 2013, there was a small reduction in the prevalence of good health. It tended to decline from just over 60% of the population to about 55% of the population. Not a huge decline. For poor health, we can see an even more stable and unchanging situation where um, less than 10% of working age adults report they're in poor health. Very interesting findings. When we look at absolute inequality, which means the difference in the proportion of the population reporting good self-rated health, which is equivalent to well-being, according to their income, we can see again for working age adults that um, the, the proportion, um, the, sorry, the difference the absolute difference, which represents the inequality between the bottom and the top group, according to income, remained below 10%. So small inequality in well-being, and this did not rise during more than 20 years of economic stagnation. The same um, stability is evident in the young old. In the old old, there is a suggestion that inequality widened, but nevertheless, even at the end of the period, um, there was inequality of less than 10 percentage points. In children, the, the curve is interesting, and we're still trying to understand what that means. So, Going back to our question of the natural experiment, did economic stagnation in Japan over the period of the study lead to poorer health and greater health inequality? Well, during those 20 years, income inequality was modest and stable. The headline health statistics continue to improve. And overall, levels of well being remain similar to those during the miracle growth period before 1992. And inequality in well being, according to income, was broadly stable. So, 
thinking about the big post-growth, post-pandemic question, how tight is the link between economic growth, human health and well-being? And it would appear from these fascinating Japanese data that it is not very close, not very tight. So can we have our planet and our health? Well, from this perspective, yes. But we've got to work out how we get from where we are to where we want to be in terms of uh, what we're doing to the environment. To look at the question another way, can we ditch the orthodoxy that our well-being depends on economic growth? And my answer is, it will be difficult, but yes, we must. Well, thank you for listening. And um, those um, graphs about health in Japan, both the mortality and the self-rated health data, are in... Um, our new book, which will be coming out very soon, possibly this month, possibly in September, called Health in Japan. And I'll be talking about it um, a little bit more in the Q&A session um, at the end of the first day. Thank you very much for listening.